Science and our distinguished guest is already here. Uh, so uh, let me start uh, our seminar and introduce Professor Raman Rafiko, uh, whose deep uh, origin is uh, the Moscow Institute of uh, uh, Physics and Technology, our beloved partner. But then, after getting the bachelor degree there, Raman um, got master and PhD degrees at Princeton University. And uh, actually, as far as I understand, Roman uh, loved this place and uh, his career, uh, instead of small two-year break at uh, Canada Theoretical Astrophysics Institute uh, at Toronto, he stayed, uh, he preferred to stay at Princeton at the East studies where, where he's currently uh, holding the uh, associate professor position. The title is on the screen and so I'll pass the, uh, <coughs> sorry, the wall to, to Roman and please 45 minutes and then I'm mm -hmm. time of question, questions. More or less please. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here uh, to see in this you know, new, new brand new building, brand new initiative. And I uh, really look forward to learning more uh, about this uh, place in the next uh, couple of days. Uh, so let me uh, start by providing sort of a brief outline of my, uh, of my talk. First, I'll tell you a little bit about my past and uh, present research, uh, specifically uh, focusing on one particular area, which uh, would be uh, the formation of planets and the uh, current uh, recent, uh, recent achievements in the field of the uh, planetary uh, sciences, uh, including some uh, references to some recent results uh, that have been obtained uh, using a new technological sort of frontier in exoplanet detection, which is a direct uh, imaging. Then I will uh, switch to uh, discussing the future ideas and we'll talk about some project that uh, I think I will be focusing on uh, quite intensely in, uh, in the future, which will be uh, in understanding uh, the behavior of the space uh, debris in low Earth orbits and trying to figure out how uh, the, the behavior of the space debris can affect, uh, can affect uh, human and um, human uh, space flight and other aspects of the near earth space exploration so my research uh, interests uh, uh, you know i'm trying in my in doing my research i'm trying to be to stay quite broad and uh, you know i work on uh, the different aspects of uh, uh, science uh, related to uh, exoplanets as well as the planets in in our own uh, solar system so i work on the formation characterization of exoplanets uh, dynamics is a big uh, theoretical and numerical aspect uh, of my work where i uh, work on uh, dynamics of particles uh, basically small particle dynamics and body dynamics and so on as well as uh, fluid dynamics, uh, that is uh, studying uh, things like accretion disks, uh, uh, various astrophysical flows, and so on. Uh, and that also brings me to the high energy astrophysics where these accretion disks are often uh, featured uh, some uh, MHD and electromagnetic um, uh, processes uh, as well as uh, things related to general relativity such as black holes and their astrophysical uh, manifestations in active uh, galactic nuclei, quasars, uh, binary black holes, and uh, uh, so on and so forth. And uh, the main approach which I use in my, uh, in my work is basically uh, analytical uh, assisted with uh, numerical um, uh, simulations uh, and I do like to build models, uh, simple and complex, take uh, phenomena apart to understand the basic uh, uh, governing uh, features. So just uh, uh, to provide uh, some uh, slight description of what I've uh, been uh, sort of uh, more specifics, a little bit more specifics uh, on a high energy side, uh, one of the things I've uh, uh, invested my time is what the physics of the so-called double pulsar which is a, a binary consisting of the two neutron stars uh, that has been discovered in uh, 2005 uh, and uh, the possibility of uh, seeing these two neutron stars beaming at us uh, as a radio beacons uh, allowed us uh, to really uh, study quite well various general relativistic effects and I contributed to understanding the magnetosphere of these uh, pulsars. Uh, in general uh, electrodynamics of uh, various types of magnetospheres is something that I uh, historically started to uh, explore here in Russia and then uh, you know I switched to actually using uh, uh, um, pulsars as uh, tools for probing uh, various uh, interesting uh, effects. Um, 
And on a side of uh, accretion disk physics, uh, I've explored physics of gravitationally unstable disks. I've explored physics of uh, uh, accretion disks uh, where the gas basically falls on the surface uh, of the star and explored uh, uh, the interactions arising in the so-called boundary layer uh, at the surface uh, of, the, of the star. And we have uh, come up with a novel mechanism of the angular momentum transport in this uh, uh, in this uh, for such uh, objects uh, and uh, uh, work now on uh, understanding the implications of uh, this uh, finding for the uh, of, of, of these uh, findings uh, for the accretion onto different types of compact uh, objects uh, then uh, dynamics of fluids uh, have become uh, quite uh, interesting and important in the context of studies of exoplanetary systems where we when we discovered a lot of planets which are sitting very close to their parent stars recently understood that uh, this uh, the fact that we are finding planets so close to their stars is connected to the fact that planets are actually gravitationally interacting very strongly with uh, the protoplanetary disks in which uh, they're embedded. And as a result of this interaction, they launch these uh, density waves, non axisymmetric density waves that cause angular momentum exchange between the disks and planets and drive planets towards uh, uh, closer towards uh, the central stars. And, but in the process to understand this uh, important phenomenon of uh, uh, migration, planet migration and opening of a gap, a uh, gap in the accretion disk, we needed to understand uh, various details of the coupling between uh, uh planets and disks, various nonlinear and linear phenomena uh, that arise uh, in the process of uh, wave uh, density, wave excitation, propagation, and uh, damping. And so that has been a pretty interesting and rewarding uh, branch of uh, uh, my research. But the most important uh, things, especially in recent, uh, recently for me, were uh, understanding uh, planet uh, formation and trying to uh, link uh, uh, ideas in planet formation to observations. So observationally, uh, let me, let me just cover uh, very briefly uh, this uh, sort of topic. Observationally, uh, we know, of course, that we have eight planets, eight major planets in our own solar system that can be uh, loosely grouped into three categories. This would be terrestrial planets sitting on the inside of the solar system, which are typically quite rocky, have uh, little uh, volatile uh, content uh, in them. Then we have gas giants, uh, Jupiter and uh, Saturn. Uh, these two guys uh, do have course in their centers. We know this uh, from uh, measurements uh, of the orbits of the natural and artificial uh, satellites uh, that uh, were uh, present in these uh, systems. Uh, and uh, uh, then we have uh, ice giants, which are basically, you know, they have masses of about uh, somewhat less than 20, uh, 20 Earth masses, uh, which have big cores with a mass of uh, 13 to 15 uh, Earth masses, and a, a veneer of uh, atmospheres, which are actually not so massive, with a mass of about a couple Earth masses, but that provide a big contribution to the sizes of uh, these objects. But what's important is that uh, effectively you, you can think of uh, the terrestrial planets as bare uh, cores composed of refractory materials, and then uh, all the giant planets also have some uh, cores in their centers with a mass between uh, 5 to maybe 20 uh, Earth masses, uh, both in Saturn and in uh, Jupiter. And Uranus and Neptune also have these cores, presumably composed uh, not, uh, not fully of rock, but you know, of some ices, but still this is material which is uh, heavier than hydrogen and helium. And so that gives us interesting uh, clues and hints to understanding uh, uh, the formation of these uh, uh, objects. Then, uh, next step is uh, discoveries of uh, exoplanets. I mean, we can go beyond our solar system and think uh, about the planets uh, in the universe. Uh, this journey started in uh, ex actually uh, 20 years ago, exactly 20 years ago, with the discovery of uh, this uh, planet, 51 Peg, by the so-called Doppler, uh, Doppler method. Uh, in the Doppler method, you're looking at the tiny shifts of the spectral lines of the star uh, as a planet is orbiting, uh, a massive planet is orbiting the star and uh, the star then uh, moves around the common very center of the system. Uh, right now the technology has developed to such an extent that we are able to measure uh, velocities, so these radial velocities down to the level of about one meter per second which allows us to uh, measure presence of the planets uh, as low mass as, for example, the Earth uh, in uh, several day orbits around, uh, around the stars. But this does require pretty big uh, telescope, uh, telescopes to do uh, such uh, studies. 
The next frontier in the discoveries and characterization of exoplanets uh, has been uh, the transits. This is uh, another uh, very popular method now uh, to detect planets. In the transit method, you basically look for the periodic dimmings of, of the uh, stellar light, uh, which is shown here. The brightness is initially almost constant, then it drops down because a planet is uh, going across uh, the face uh, of the star. And this is a, a method which has been used by the uh, Kepler mission, by this uh, satellite that has discovered thousands and thousands of uh, planetary uh, candidates, which are basically shown uh, here. This is size, uh, this is orbital period. Uh, uh, of course, this method, since it's relied, it relies on the covering of the sort of surface of the star, uh, it gives you information about the size of the planet and not about the mass. Doppler uh, method actually gives you information about the mass of the planet because the more massive is a planet, the bigger is a Doppler shift, the bigger is the displacement of, uh, of the star. Uh, but here you're just getting the information about the size of the object. In many cases, you can get uh, both types of measurements for a particular uh, object, uh, and then uh, you can get both the mass and the radius uh, for the planet, and this allows you to start uh, exploring the physical conditions in these planets. Uh, for example, this is a sample of uh, planets which have been transiting and were also uh, had their masses uh, measured uh, by the Doppler uh, method, and uh, then you can make these comparisons, uh, basically build a uh, build, uh, mass radius relations for different uh, compositions, for example, pure iron, pure rock, pure water, uh, pure hydrogen for many of these uh, planets. And you can see that the massive planets with masses of about Jupiter mass or uh, sort of uh, 3 to 10 Jupiter masses are actually uh, lying uh, uh, very close to the curve uh, of, the, of the objects which are composed of pure hydrogen. And then as you go to lower masses, you start shifting towards objects uh, which have a high content of uh, uh, rocky material uh, in them. So we are getting a lot of uh, uh, information about objects very far removed from us, about the exoplanets which are actually could be as distant as several kilometers parsec away uh, from us uh, and that would be sort of the distance to the galactic center or so. <clears throat> Now, that all motivated uh, uh, our thinking uh, about the formation of planets. And uh, uh, first of all, when I'm talking about the formation of planets, I should probably tell you about their birthplaces. Uh, we think that uh, planetary construction zones, uh, so the, to, to, to uh, sort of uh, call them this way, uh, are actually the pr so called protoplanetary disks. Uh, protoplanetary disks are uh, pretty massive collections of gas and dust uh, around the stars, which are uh, in centrifugal uh, support. Uh, you form them uh, as a result result of uh, gravitational collapse of dense uh, clouds of um uh, interstellar medium, uh, which basically leads to the formation of the central star, and then the surrounding disk uh, uh, and the disk uh, that's in differential rotation around uh, around the stars. Uh, these disks typically have a mass of about uh, one thousandth to one tenth uh, of the mass of the central star, uh, and about one percent of their mass sits in the tiny dust particles, particles with sizes which are less than a micron. Uh, the sizes of these disks range from basically it's usually t several hundred as astronomical units. Uh, and the disks are very cold. Uh, they have temperatures of several tens to maybe hundreds of uh, Kelvin. Uh, and uh, we observe these disks in various uh, different uh, ways. We can observe them uh, in uh, scattered light. That is, uh, they are basically act like mirrors, uh, scattering the light produced by the central star. Or we can uh, observe their own uh, infrared and submillimeter uh, emission, like uh, uh, in this uh, beautiful uh, recent image obtained with uh, the Atacama Large Millimeter uh, Observatory a large millimeter uh, array that shows uh, an image of a planet uh, forming disk with this beautiful uh, gap uh, uh, structures in them. From the statistics of this, uh, uh, of this uh, protoplanetary disks, we know that their lifetimes are about uh, between one to 10 million years. And that's important because it basically gives you constraint uh, on the formation of planets. You need to form uh, giant planets uh, during the time when the gas, uh, when the protoplanetary disk is still orbiting the central star because as soon as the disk goes away, as soon as it evaporates, uh, then there is no more material uh, to be incorporated into the giant planet. So there is no more gas. And so that constraint is actually very important for the uh, theories of uh, uh, planet formation. In a nutshell, uh, the formation of uh, things like terrestrial planets uh, looks uh, as a sequence of uh, different processes that lead us from tiny particles with the sizes of uh, less than a micron to objects with sizes uh, about the size of the Earth. Uh, so we start with this uh, disk of uh, gas and dust, uh, and this dust uh, 
over time merges into bigger and bigger uh, objects. You form uh, rocky or icy objects called uh, planetesimals, which look like basically asteroids. And the number of these asteroids is so huge they, they, that they keep uh, colliding with each other, merging, growing into bigger and bigger uh, uh, objects until you form so-called planetary embryos. Uh, even bigger objects with sizes of, let's say, several thousand kilometers. These guys can also collide with each other and uh, grow into bigger and bigger cores. And at some point, this cores may lead to the formation of uh, giant planets. So this happens when these cores are pretty massive. They have to exceed the mass uh, of the Earth uh, to, be, to actually uh, serve as uh, seeds of uh, uh, giant planet formation. And the most uh, popular theory for the formation of uh, uh, gas giants is, actu is actually closely related to the presence of, uh, to the presence of uh, cores. So this theory is a so-called uh, core accretion which has, has been developed um, since uh, the end of the uh, 70s. Basically postulates that first of all you have to form this massive uh, core made out of refractory elements, rocks uh, and ices. Uh, as the core is growing uh, inside, of this, uh, inside of the nebula, the gravity of the core core starts to attract an atmosphere uh, and because there is an effectively infinite supply of gas around this core. Uh, so you form this uh, atmosphere around the core, at the same time you keep bombarding this core with uh, planetesimals which releases a lot of gravitational energy, so you have a lot of this gravitational luminosity diffusing out uh, through the core. Uh, and uh, as the core gets more and more massive, uh, the mass of the atmosphere around it uh, increases as well. At some point, mass of the atmosphere becomes comparable to the mass of the core, and the whole structure becomes uh, sort of self-gravitating, and then it effectively collapses and accretes more and more uh, gas. This is uh, roughly schematically shown on this plot, where each of these uh, different color curves uh, represents uh, gross uh, scenarios uh, at the current location of Jupiter. This is basically a formation of Jupiter plot uh, uh, for different values of the initial density of gas uh, uh, at this uh, location. So when you take a very high density of the gas and dust, uh, the solid curve shows the growth of the core mass, uh, the dot dotted uh, curve is the growth of the gas mass, and the total is uh, the sum of the two. So you can see that when the gas and solid mass uh, becomes comparable, there is a very rapid uh, increase increase in the mass of the combined object, and this is how we think uh, Jupiter uh, has formed in a solar uh, system. By the way, uh, please uh, uh, ask questions uh, during the talk if you have uh, any, you know, I want to keep it uh, pretty informal. So the, uh, this core accretion uh, CA uh, has certain, uh, certain um, Beauties, uh, beauties to it. So first of all, it naturally uh, explains uh, the existence of the cores uh, inside of the uh, giant planets, uh, such as Uranus, Neptune, Saturn, and Jupiter. You simply need these cores to trigger the formation of uh, these uh, planets. Then, theoretically, when you study the, uh, these uh, you know, details of the core accretion, you typically find that the core masses uh, uh, that you need are uh, around 5 to 50 uh, Earth masses. And this is very, very well consistent. This is a good range to explain the cores uh, that exist inside of the planets inside of the solar system, where we have these measurements of the core masses. Finally, uh, this core accretion idea is consistent with the so-called metallicity correlation uh, that's known observationally that predicts that the higher is the metallicity of the star, the higher the chance to find a giant planet in the system. And that's consistent because when you, uh, when you need to rely on the buildup of the core, you basically the higher is the metallicity, the higher is the content of um, uh, elements heavier than hydrogen and helium, the faster you will be able to build the core. And the, uh, the more likely it is that you will be able to form the giant planet within the several million year uh, time scale uh, that uh, is known from observations. Now, uh, core accretion also has some problems. Uh, the problems actually arise uh, even in a solar system when we start thinking about the formation of uh, ice giants such as Neptune uh, and the Uranus. And the problems are also related to the uh, formation of the core. Uh, the thing is that the core uh, formation actually requires a lot of time. Uh, especially in the outer parts of the, uh, of, the, of the planetary system because all the dynamical processes there are very slow. For example, the orbital time scale of uh, Uranus is uh, 238 years. That's very long uh, time scale because it's so far uh, from the Sun. Uh, 
Uh, and now in extrasolar, uh, we, we, are, we are starting to discover uh, planetary systems, uh, extrasolar planetary systems, in which planets are also moving on very wide orbits. So in this case, this is a famous uh, system, HR8799, which has four very massive giant planets with masses about 10 Jupiter masses, which actually are uh, as distant from their parent star as uh, 70 astronomical units. So that's 70 times uh, the distance between the Sun uh, and the Earth. So how can you form planets within several million years at such separation? is a big, big puzzle. Uh, and uh, uh, this is something that we are trying very hard uh, to understand right now. Basically, uh, whether it's possible for the core accretion to be able to form uh, such planets, uh, uh, such planets within a lifetime given to us by uh, observations. Now, there is an al alternative idea for the formation of giant planets uh, that says that if you have a very massive uh, gaseous disk, which could be a reality in the beginning, uh, in the beginning stages of the uh, formation of the planetary systems, uh, then the disk may fall apart basically under its own self-gravity. This is a so-called gravitational instability uh, uh, idea. And this is sort of an image from a typical simulation of a gravitationally unstable disk. The instability sets in when uh, the so-called Tumri Q parameter, which is a combination of different physical uh, parameters of the disk gets less than one uh, and uh, whenever uh, you set up a disk that has such a characteristics you typically see that it starts producing uh, strong non axisymmetric motions drive uh, spiral arms and in some cases actually falling apart into bound self gravitating objects that can be thought of as uh, seeds for planet formation so you would think that this is great because uh, in this case uh, the instability is very fast. It de develops on a time scale of let's say thousands of years, which would be really good news for um, uh, fitting this uh, time scale constraint. But the problem is that actually there are some issues with the thermodynamics of this uh, process. That is, uh, you can only collapse uh, rapidly the ball of gas if this ball of gas can cool, because otherwise, as you uh, try to compress the gas, it heats up and opposes uh, the collapse. It basically bounces back. And that, that, that is a big problem that is not satisfied in all uh, the disks. So uh, it, it, this, we have shown, you know, and I contributed to this, that uh, this gravitational instability works best uh, far from the star. It's operations, uh, let's say, beyond the uh, 50 astronomical units. In the regime where the core accretion, which I described before, uh, actually is not working all that well. And that uh, sort of brings uh, the question of maybe we should uh, probe this range of uh, distances, the, this uh, sort of separations from the star, this range of about 50 astronomical units where we expect transition in a, a mode of the planet formation from uh, the core accretion to, let's say, gravitational, uh, gravitational instability. Uh, but uh, the problem is that it's difficult to probe this range of uh, separations. These uh, two methods which I mentioned, the Doppler, Doppler uh, uh, shifts uh, effectively Doppler effect uh, and the transits, they work best for objects which are pretty close to their parent stars, simply because you know uh, the strength of the signal increases in this case uh, and the probability of, uh, let's say, transit uh, increases uh, strongly uh, as well. So at, at separations of hundreds of AU, you will not be able to explore planets by these uh, uh, methods. So what you do instead is you uh, use uh, the so-called direct imaging, which I think is sort of the future of uh, this uh, field. The future uh, of uh, trying to understand the modes of giant planet formation at large uh, and small separations. So what is uh, uh, direct imaging? Direct imaging relies on the fact that when the planets are young, when the giant planets are young, they're actually pretty hot. That's because there is a lot of energy, that uh, gravitational energy that goes in the formation of these objects and then they have to cool off and lose this excess heat that's stored uh, inside of them. And so for several tens of millions of years, planets are actually self-luminous. They produce a lot of uh, luminosity in the near infrared that can be observed uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, telescopes. And that's uh, the method by which uh, these uh, planets in HR8799 has been discovered, planet around the Beta Pictoris, Fomalhaut, and other um, uh, systems have been uh, found. And once you have that, once you have a star that you know is young, you can just look around it and try to see objects like uh, these guys. And when you, then when you have a big sample of uh, planets discovered by these methods, uh, you need uh, to play with statistics and try to see uh, how things uh, change uh, um, you know, from uh, one, system, one system to another. <clears throat> now the big issue with this, uh, with this uh, 
with the direct uh, imaging uh, technology is that you basically, I mean, the, the, pr the problem with direct imaging is that what, what you're trying to do is you're trying to uh, see effectively a firefly next to a lighthouse, very close to a, to a lighthouse. Because the contrast between the planet, between such a giant planet, and the star is actually something at the level of 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6. So, uh, because of that, uh, you know, the starlight completely dominates uh, the signal coming from the planet, and to see the planet is extremely difficult. The things are also complicated by the fact uh, that while uh, with a big telescope you can see very fine uh, details typically, but if you're observing from the ground and not from space, if you're not using uh, something like Hubble Space Telescope or JWST in the future, uh, then you have a big problem which is called atmosphere. Atmospheric turbulence blurs, uh, blurs uh, all the images of the stars, planets, uh, well, not planets, not so much, but for the stars, uh, it definitely is a, big, uh, is a big problem. And because of that, uh, naturally, if, even if you're observing things with a 10-meter telescope, your size of a star would be something like one arc second instead of uh, uh, two hundredths uh, of an arc second. So that's a big problem, and recently uh, there has been a big uh, development of technology to try to uh, resolve this problem. And that uh, technology is called uh, adaptive optics. So what this adaptive op optics uh, does, it basically, uh, you have a telescope that looks uh, at some bright uh, object, some bright reference uh, star, or in some cases the star is created uh, sort of artificially. Uh, like in this case you have a big laser that shines at a sodium layer located in the atmosphere of the Earth at a height of about 90 kilometers. And it effectively creates an artificial bright uh, source of light. Then uh, at the telescope you are measuring the wave front uh, uh, distortions uh, that occur when this uh, sort of flat, uh, flat uh, wave front propagates through the turbulent uh, atmosphere. And once you measure these things, uh, you run a, a special uh, software on a computer that effectively uh, corrects for these uh, atmospheric distortions by uh, applying a signal to the small actuators, basically piezo elements attached to the back of the mirror of the telescope, uh, that deforms uh, the surface of the telescope in such a way as to cancel these atmospheric uh, perturbations, these uh, atmospheric turbulence. So this is extremely complicated technology that has been developed uh, in a recent uh, couple of decades, but that enabled us to do amazing things. Now all the big telescopes, you know, CAC, uh, VLT in Chile and so on, have this uh, technology, and uh, it does great things. So for example, this is an image of the Beta Pictoris uh, star without uh, adaptive optics. It's just a big blurb of light, okay? Then you apply adaptive optics and you concentrate this light into a much smaller region which would make any object that would be sitting uh, nearby much more visible. Then you put in a special thing called a coronagraph, which basically blocks the light of the central source. So you kill this central light, you dramatically increase uh, the contrast in the image. And then you do additional post-processing and you find an object like this uh, planet in the system Beta Pictoris B. So it's a com complicated convolution of many, uh, many pieces that allows you actually to do this uh, technological feat of detecting uh, planets with direct imaging. And uh, as I said, I think this is a future uh, and this is where we are going. So uh, I'm a part of uh, uh, one of such uh, direct imaging collaborations, which is called Gemini uh, Planet Imager, uh, which is installed on a Gemini South Observatory uh, in Chile. This is our GPI uh, instrument. It's a cryogenically cooled instrument, uh, extremely stable. Uh, it's a big piece of machinery that took years uh, to develop. Uh, this, for example, is an image obtained with uh, this telescope of the so-called debris disks. These are the post uh, protoplanetary disks, which basically are planetary destruction zones. So these are the belts of asteroids that are colliding with each other and producing a lot of dust that then uh, scatters uh, starlight. And we can observe uh, the, them as uh, these, you know, sort of uh, beautiful streaks of light. So we are observing several hundred of uh, young stars uh, in an effort to detect these uh, planets uh, by direct imaging technique. And this August we uh, got our first uh, sort of uh, reward. Uh, we have managed uh, to detect a young uh, Jovian planet in the nearby system 51 uh, Eridanus B. So the planet is here. These are the different images in different uh, wavelength uh, uh, bands. Uh, and you can see that there is very high signal to noise for this uh, particular detection. So we were very happy. Uh, and uh, you know, that was a big uh, discovery to us. Then, of course, uh, you know, the press uh, uh, followed up was with, uh, you know, different uh, flashy titles such as, you know, Red Hot Young Jupiter and so on and so forth. So that was a pretty uh, cool time for us. 
Um, uh, so this, this is a sort of a scientific uh, content, basically it's sort of the boring uh, stuff which contains actually a lot of information. This is a spectrum of this planet. So we are not talking about the spectrum of the star. Because we are directly imaging the planet, we can just measure the spectrum, the own emission of the planet. And this is truly amazing. Uh, you see these you know, uh, big bumps. These bumps are actually not uh, the emission line. They are uh, sort of uh, leftover emission uh, between the big troughs. Between between the big absorption bands uh, generated by uh, methane. So it turns out that this is one of the uh, few planets that has very strong methane absorption. And methane absorption is something that we also have in our own Jupiter. So in many regards, this planet is quite similar to uh, our own uh, uh, Jupiter. First of all, it has a low mass. Its mass is only two Jupiter masses, while all other directly imaged planets typically have masses you know, much higher, about 10 uh, Jupiter masses. Then this guy is also quite close to its parent star. It's uh, at uh, 13 astronomical units, which is slightly further out than the semi-major axis of Saturn in our own solar system. So if you uh, put all of this uh, together, it looks like uh, this planet is a sort of combination of uh, what we have in our own solar system. So it's pretty close to the star, it uh, looks like Jupiter, you know, it smells like Jupiter, so presumably it has formed like a Jupiter as well. Uh, and that means that this is good news for this first idea for the formation of giant planets, for the core accretion. And that's something that, uh, you know, went into this uh, original uh, science uh, uh, paper, uh, that, you know, this, paper, this, this particular system is a great uh, test of our planet formation theories. Okay, good. Uh, this system is also, uh, is also quite interesting in, the in the terms of its uh, dynamics. Uh, well, if you look at this uh, press uh, image, this is a, this uh, planet. It's basically, you know, a Jupiter in the infrared. Uh, uh, this is 51 Eridanus uh, star. Then there is this uh, sort of binary thing hanging in the corner. Well, it turns out that this is a real object. Uh, I mean, th this is just, you know, artist's representation, of course, but the artist put this binary star in there for a purpose, because uh, this 51 Eridanus B is actually a part of a triple system. Uh, so it's about 2,000 to you, a very large separation from this uh, uh, planetary system. There is a companion, which is also itself a binary, that's sort of orbiting uh, this system with a very long uh, period of about 10 to the 5 years or so. Okay, so it, and because of that, you know, because of the gravitational coupling between different components of the system and the orbit of the planet, there is interesting dynamics uh, that uh, can arise uh, in this system and play a very important uh, uh, role in its uh, future, uh, or, in, in its uh, or future orbital evolution. So, uh, just a short summary of my current work before I uh, sort of move on to the future is that. Um, I believe uh, that one of the most important discoveries in uh, astrophysics and in science in general in the last uh, uh, two decades have been the, the discovery of extrasolar planets. I mean, public loves this. Uh, you know, everybody uh, understands that this is a, a great thing from, uh, for understanding the place of the humanity in the universe uh, and so on. And this drove tremendous observational and technological progress uh, in these areas. Uh, it, it has drove a tremendous progress in terms of the ideas for the origin, dynamics, for of these planets and so on. Uh, and the, right now there are tons of uh, space and uh, uh, ground-based uh, projects developed uh, uh, to find more planets and to characterize them. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Russia is uh, sort of uh, on the sidelines of this uh, technological and uh, scientific development uh, at the time, and, but hopefully the uh, situation will improve, uh, in, will improve uh, in the future. But in the world, at least, there are lots of projects. You know, JWST, TESS, these are all space projects. PLATO is a European space project. GPI Sphere, these are direct imaging uh, uh, facilities of the kind that I described before. They are devoted to understanding uh, uh, formation and the evolution of planets uh, in the universe. So I believe that there is a great uh, future uh, in the exoplanet field and it would be great if uh, Russia could uh, contribute and participate in it uh, to some extent at least. Okay, now let me tell, me t tell, you, uh, tell you about uh, sort of the future, some ideas that I have uh, uh, which are mo of more applied uh, kind that could be uh, quite, uh, quite uh, sort of uh, interesting and uh, useful and uh, practical. So uh, what you see here on this image or actually on uh, this image as well 
are the positions of uh, many of the known uh, satellites that have been uh, launched into space. This is just a snapshot that shows uh, positions of the satellites. You know, this could be active satellites or dead satellites. But uh, there are lots of uh, special tracking facilities that are, that are monitoring the space and determining these satellite positions. What you see in the center is, of course, our Earth. And you, can, you see this white blur around it. Uh, this white blur are the satellites in low Earth orbits, the orbits with the height of, uh, let's say, several hundred to several thousand uh, kilometers above the Earth. Uh, this ring are the satellites in geostationary orbits. Uh, this is an orbit with a, re with a, with a radius of uh, 36,000 uh, kilometers, which are basically just hanging over a particular uh, part uh, of the Earth. And there's a lot of communication satellites parked in these uh, particular orbits. But the space is, you know, in between is also filled with uh, various, uh, various uh, satellites. And a lot of these, uh, a lot of these uh, objects are just basically space junk. Uh, the biggest uh, pieces of space junk are effectively dead satellites or some booster stages of rockets, uh, you know, so big uh, pieces of uh, equipment that are staying uh, in orbit. But there is also a uh, bunch of uh, small, uh, small, uh, small objects. For example, if uh, uh, there was some failure at launch and, you know, satellite exploded, then you would have a lot of fragments. Uh, the fuel can freeze in orbit and the droplets of fuel will produce uh, sort of microscopic uh, uh, pieces of uh, space debris. So there is a lot of uh, simply simple junk flying uh, flying in orbits, and most of this debris, of course, resides in low Earth orbits because this is where most of the satellites uh, that produce uh, this debris uh, lives as well. Now below 2,000 kilometers, uh, well, these are some numbers, sort of. Uh, you can find a huge number of objects with uh, uh, small sizes. So there is about 300 kilograms of particles less than one millimeter. And while you would think that this is not a large number, it's less than uh, total weight of all the people in this room. Uh, actually, if you count the numbers of these objects, you would discover that this is a huge number. It's, you know, millions and millions of uh, particles with these, uh, with these sizes. And they are dangerous. These things are moving with velocities of several kilometers per second. So the sort of uh, the velocity of circular motion around the Earth uh, at not too far, not, not, not a very good, uh, big height is, you know, several, about 10 kilometers per second, 8 kilometers per second. And if you take this velocity and you take one millimeter fragment um, and calculate its kinetic energy, this kinetic energy is equivalent to a kinetic energy of a rock, of one kilogram rock moving at 100 kilometers per sec, uh, sorry, 100 kilometers per hour. <laughs> so imagine a car that moves with 100 kilometers per hour and you, know, you throw a stone at it. This is, you know, you, you, don't, you don't expect that the good thing will happen in this case, right? And uh, we know uh, that the satellites are already suffering from this problem. Uh, these are, for example, images of, uh, these are two images from the shuttle wind, uh, windscreen. Uh, these are basically the dents which are produced by the collisions of a space shuttle with uh, these microscopic pieces of debris. This is a hole that's produced in the radiator of the space shuttle and it has a pretty significant, uh, pretty significant uh, size. So these guys are actually uh, dangerous and you know, they are hitting space shuttle which is a human operated uh, facility. So that means that they are putting danger to the uh, human space flight. Of course, uh, they're putting even bigger danger to the operations of various artificial satellites because the, the, these guys are simply much more numerous. Uh, and you can just, you know, simply probabilistic, prob probabilistically try to estimate the danger. You can say, okay, well, I have a satellite. What is the probability of my satellite colliding with uh, such particle which would be as damaging as this, you know, kilogram rock moving at 100, kilometer, 100 kilometers per hour? Uh, by using a simple n sigma v uh, sort of uh, argument, as we call it in a kinetic uh, theory, you can estimate that this time scale for a satellite with a typical area, cross-sectional area of uh, 10 square meters would be something on the order of 100 years. And this means that you know, within a one year operation of uh, your uh, satellite, you have 1% chance of being hit by this thing. And this is a high probability, this is a very high probability. That means that the presence of this uh, space debris uh, makes uh, space pretty dangerous uh, place. Interestingly, uh, humans uh, sort of had uh, this uh, pollution of the space uh, uh, started, the pollution of the space started very, very early on in a, in a space uh, age and uh, it was of course related to something uh, military. So, uh, US military in 1963 launched in space uh, several uh, hundred million of tiny 
tiny metal needles. Uh, the goal was very interesting. They were afraid that uh, if there would be a nuclear war between the US, uh, USSR and the uh, USA, then the USSR would cut off uh, the under, un underwater transatlantic uh, cables and there would be no communication between Europe and the United States. At, the time, at, the at, at that time, uh, the satellite uh, communications was not uh, developed a technology. So instead, they thought that they will just you know, launch this uh, humongous number of uh, tiny needles. Each of these needles had a size of about 1.8 uh, centimeters. And it was a half wavelength dipole uh, for the 8 gigahertz uh, radio emission. So the idea was that these uh, needles would spread in orbit and create sort of an effective mirror through which they, they would then send radio signals and they would bounce back to Earth uh, and you know, be detected uh, across uh, the Atlantic. But that meant they, they basically contaminated space uh, at an altitude of uh, 3,700 kilometers with this uh, half a billion of uh, tiny needles. And that was not very good and it, uh, it caused a huge outcry of uh, scientists in the world and this experiment was never uh, was never repeated and luckily you know most of these uh, needles have uh, spiraled in because they were affected by the uh, aerodynamic, dra aerodynamic drag, uh, as uh, all small particles do, and they uh, sort of uh, most of them have uh, vanished. But then there were some other additional military contributions. Uh, so uh, Soviets and Americans in the 70s have been testing uh, anti-satellite uh, missiles of various uh, varieties. Uh, there has been some recent examples of this. For example, uh, US military uh, in the 80s uh, shot down their own Solvind uh, a scientific satellite which was sort of malfunctioning and dying and to test a particular anti-satellite -sat uh, rocket technology they just uh, you know uh, made this uh, uh, test which resulted in the production of 287 pieces of catalog debris and a uh, much larger number of smaller uh, particles. Uh, more recently Chinese uh, in 2008 uh, had a similar test they shut down uh, polar uh, satellite Fang Yun, uh, and that resulted in the production of this uh, large number of debris. This is actually the biggest, uh, biggest event of the debris production, uh, sort of in intentional uh, debris production. It's about 23,000, 2300, sorry, uh, of um, the big uh, trackable uh, debris particles and a huge number of smaller ones. And this was a you know, dangerous thing, so even uh, the International Space Station had to, uh, at one point, to perform the avoidance maneuver to not collide with the, some of this uh, debris. So this is a real problem for human uh, spaceflight right now. And then there is, you know, some more recent tests, you know, next year after China had this test, Americans also did uh, another one, uh, sort of to show uh, their capabilities, I guess. <coughs> uh, all of that is, uh, you know, sort of fun and interesting, but there is a real problem here. Uh, and this real problem was uh, uh, realized by um, uh, a scientist uh, uh, called Kessler in 1978. When he figured out that uh, when you have a collision of bigger, big objects, you produce a lot of small objects. When these small objects collide with each other, you produce even smaller guys. And all of them are dangerous. I mean, as I showed, uh, even the tiny uh, sort of sub-millimeter particles are very, very dangerous. But then uh, this, uh, this uh, collisional production of uh, fragments uh, leads to the so-called fragmentation cascade, uh, which may develop in an unstable fashion. And if it develops in an unstable fa fashion, you have this uncontrollable growth in a number of uh, uh, fragments in space, which basically you know, looks like this, like this you know, early image of a protoplanetary disk which I showed to you. But now this would be uh, sort of artificial particles colliding, uh, colliding with each other. And that uh, theme was uh, played very well in this recent uh, movie uh, called Gravity, which, if you remember, you know, started with a sort of uh, military test of uh, uh, anti-satellite missile that led to the complete, uh, complete devastation of near-Earth uh, uh, sort of uh, space. So that is a big problem and uh, one wants to understand whether this scenario is actually realistic, whether uh, such a chain of events like you know, collisions between satellites can really result in uh, the whole near-Earth space being completely unusable for the long operation of uh, uh, spacecraft. Um, so something like this has already, uh, has already been uh, sort of happening. I mean, we uh, have already witnessed unintentional uh, collisions between uh, satellites that lead to the production of large amount of uh, space debris. 
So for example, in uh, 2009, there was a famous event of the collision of the two big satellites. It was a radium communication satellite, uh, operational at that time, and the non-operational uh, Russian military uh, communications uh, satellite launched in 1993, which was already dead by that time. So when the two guys uh, collided, the collision happened at this uh, enormous velocity at a height of 800 kilometers over uh, the Taimir Peninsula uh, in Russia. And uh, this collision produced a large number of uh, debris fragments, you know, about 1,000 pieces of large uh, debris, which is uh, easily trackable. So you can see that tr the orbits of this debris 10 minutes after, 15 minutes after, uh, and so on. So you might think, well, this is a you know, start of uh, this uh, Kessler, Kessler uh, catastrophe uh, that has been predicted. So far, it didn't lead to such a devastating uh, uh, devastating uh, outcome as uh, uh, was envisaged a long time ago by Ke Kessler, but you know we still want to understand whether uh, you know this catastrophic scenario could be, could ever be realized, and what can you do uh, to avoid it? So uh, what uh, I'm uh, think of uh, doing uh, in the future is to try to understand this evolution, collisional evolution of the population of space debris uh, in the near Earth uh, space environment. Typically, you study uh, fragmentation cascades to understand uh, uh, something like evolution of the asteroid belt, size of objects in the asteroid belt, size of objects in the Kuiper belt. Uh, these are naturally uh, found natural uh, objects in our own solar system. This is, for example, the size distribution of objects in the uh, asteroid belt that you know have good measurements for and have a lot of models uh, that we can follow uh, them with. Uh, my own group uh, has uh, done some work on uh, uh, fragmentation evolution and collisional evolution of um, objects and uh, we have a uh, good codes that uh, you know can track uh, evolution of uh, the system for many many collisional time scale we have been finding some very interesting effects uh, that are related to the nonlinearities in the, uh, the fragmentation uh, evolution of uh, the different of different collisional uh, systems uh, in principle what you do when you're trying to understand fragmentation cascade is you're trying to solve this uh, integra differential equation that looks uh, that it looks kind of complicated, but on the other hand, if you put it on a computer and solve it, well, there is no problem, right? Uh, the thing is, uh, I mean, w w what this equation shows is basically evolution of a number of objects in some particular mass bin uh, due to the uh, sort of uh, arrival of uh, new fragments into this particular ma mass bin in collisions of objects with mass M1 and M2. This is a cross-section for their collision, and this is their numbers. Uh, so this is usual, just a kinetic, uh, kinetic term. And this is a loss from this mass bin. Again, the objects from this mass bin colliding with any other objects get uh, uh, removed from this mass bin. And, uh, you know, sounds like a simple, uh, ideologically very simple thing. The problem is uh, that you actually need to understand this collision rate. So the whole, uh, the beast in this equation is uh, hidden in this uh, uh, collision rate uh, sigma v. Uh, and sigma v is basically the rate at which uh, particles uh, collide at any given moment of time. So you need to understand the dynamics, the velocities with which they are moving. You need to understand relative velocities. And you need to understand how these velocities evolve uh, uh, in time. So uh, there, there are lots of complications because usually these uh, fragmentation calculations assume uh, some sort of spatial homogeneity. Uh, uh, they are basically assuming that the, you know, the colliding particles are like molecules put in a closed vessel, in a closed box. Uh, in reality, we know that there is a complicated orbital structure uh, to the orbits of, uh, uh, in this collisional system. So for example, in asteroid belt, we know uh, that, uh, let's say, inclinations and eccentricities on semi-major axis of all the asteroids are not uniformly distributed, but instead they have these you know, dense clusters which are connected to the previous collisional evolution of the asteroid belt. The same thing will re exist in a near-Earth space because you know, collisions of big uh, objects create uh, uh, highly correlated uh, orbits of uh, uh, smaller debris. So we also, if we would plot the same, uh, make the same plot for the space debris in the near-Earth uh, space, we would find very uh, complicated granular structure, which has never been uh, considered in this uh, fragmentation cascade uh, applications and that we will uh, be able uh, to capture. And then we can also, uh, we want uh, to take into account all the full range of physical processes that affect the dynamics. So this normally people take into account presence of the moon, non-spherical shape of the earth. We will also add the gravitational perturbations due to the sun and we'll do it in both resonant and secular uh, uh, approximations. Then there is a lot of non-gravitational processes which are especially important for small particles. 
for example, aerodynamic drag, radiation pressure, solar wind. And then there are two more processes which are usually overlooked, and I think they are quite important. The coupling of the conducting objects with the terrestrial magnetic field. And uh, when you have any sort of metallic object or something uh, that uh, can get its electrons knocked off by the solar UV radiation, then you get charged, uh, charging on your objects. And then you have a usual uh, plasma drag um, that would occur uh, in this case as well. So the goals uh, of uh, the goal of the project, I mean, after we build this uh, sort of global statistical model of collisional cascade, uh, is basically to first of all understand this, the roles of these different uh, physical mechanisms affecting the dynamics of the debris and affecting collisional evolutions. Then, uh, given the positions of the you know, current uh, space debris as we know it, we will uh, identify the highest region in the orbital phase space that you, know, a potent that, you know, that you basically should never launch satellites onto these orbits because it would be very dangerous. Uh, and uh, we, could also, we will also be able to identify most dangerous objects, you know, the big uh, guys that uh, have high probability of colliding with something uh, and produce a lot of small, uh, small debris. With this, we can then uh, talk to space agencies and uh, you know, tell them to basically avoid these high-risk orbits, uh, to make uh, everything possible to deorbit uh, some particular satellites, which are extremely potential dangerous uh, sites of uh, uh, debris production, uh, and uh, maybe try to formulate some set of, set of uh, rules or procedures that uh, uh, you know, all missions uh, should be uh, observing, like you know, some deorbiting uh, uh, de orbiting procedures for bringing in satellites uh, into the atmosphere for burning or parking them in uh, you know, the high, say, major object uh, orbits where the uh, probability of collision is much lower. We expect that development of this model will lead to uh, potentially very important synergies with many, with many adjacent uh, uh, field of science and technology. And here I put in some more uh, fundamental uh, fields of science. These are more um, applied, uh, sort of uh, uh, applied, you know, fields of technology and engineering. So we need to understand space, uh, many uh, issues in space physics, such as you know, solar wind, uh, uh, the effects of the Earth magnetosphere, because there is uh, induction. Uh, interaction between the debris and magnetic field. Astrophysics, uh, you know, we will use natural uh, belts of uh, minor objects such as asteroids and Kuiper belts to test uh, the collisional uh, model that we will develop. Of course, uh, big involvement into the high performance computing because we need to run this uh, huge numerical uh, model. Uh, then, you know, what happens in a collision of two objects at high speeds? So this is what material science will tell us. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there, are close, there will be close connections with the aerospace uh, industry, both both in Russia and uh, sort of uh, uh, beyond. So, in principle, this project uh, gives a huge, pro the, the excellent prospects for uh, various um, uh, connections and cross fertilizations between different uh, fields uh, of science. And so, uh, let me just put my put up my summary slide. Uh, sorry for slightly overrunning the 45 uh, minute uh, uh, limit. Uh, so I think that there is this big uh, problem that you know uh, people are starting to become aware of uh, more and more: this contamination of uh, near-Earth uh, space with uh, space debris uh, that potentially uh, can be quite dangerous for uh, the human and uh, sort of uh, for human space flight and for artificial uh, satellite uh, operation uh, that's embodied in this uh, sort of uh, Kessler syndrome. And what we are proposing is uh, to put in a huge effort in trying to understand. Uh, the possibility of such catastrophic scenarios and uh, to understand what can we do uh, to avoid uh, these uh, catastrophic uh, possibilities. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, with direct imaging, you mean? Yes. yes, that's right. Planet is what, sorry? Well, the star is just nearby. The star. That yeah. No, 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 it's not reflected light. It's not reflected. This is the own emission of the planet. So it's not like, uh, I mean, in the case of the Earth, or let's say Jupiter in the solar system, what is. Yeah, so this is not reflected light, that's what I'm saying. 
that's because uh, the light of the star is optical light, and what you're observing is, is infrared light. Yeah, star also emits uh, in the infrared, but it doesn't emit uh, this uh, particular uh, this particular um, sort of well. I mean, this particular lines. I mean, stars don't have any methane in them. So, so, so this this is not. Uh, I mean, uh, just look at just look at this image. What you see, what we are doing is we are actually spa spa spatially spatially resolving the planet, uh, separating it from the star. So when you know that this is a this is a planet, this is a spectrum of this object that we are measuring. So, but to to avoid this contamination with a starlight, we really need to kill the starlight by a factor of 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6, and that's what this whole machinery, all this you know adaptive optics technology, is basically designed for uh, doing. Imagine this, this planet is cold. Yes. Sure. Yes, yes. Right. Yes, so uh, the reflected light will be tiny compared to the own uh, light of the planet because the separation between the planet is, and the star is very large. So because of that, the flux, stellar flux falling on the planet will be much, much, much lower uh, than the own emission of the planet. The own, I mean, you can just uh, basically... Well, in this case, the temp planets are still very hot. I mean, they have, the temperature of this planet is about 1,000 Kelvin. Because it's, you know, this uh, planet has an age, and the star have an age of about 20 million years. So because of that, planet is still hot, it's cooling off. If you would uh, take current Jupiter and put it at this separation, we would, of course, not be able to see it, because it completely cooled off, and its temperature is, uh, you know, like, I don't know, 100 Kelvin or so. So at these temperatures, you know, because the luminosity goes as temperature to the force power, sigma t to the force, of course at 100 Kelvin you would not be able to see anything. But while the planets are still hot, uh, we can see their own emission. And that's why, the, the, that's the whole idea of this uh, uh, direct imaging, uh, uh, and it only uh, applies to sort of young, uh, very young uh, stars, around which you still have these self-luminous cooling planets. This, this, this guy is pretty hot, so the temperature is probably, um, probably 8,000 Kelvin or so, because this is a star more massive than, uh, than the sun. It's about uh, 2 or maybe 1.5, no, no it's, it's about 1.5 solar masses. So the temperature should be around you know, 7 to 8,000 Kelvin. After, after you suppress, well, uh, yes, 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 it, 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 it's, more, it's more than the reflected light, yes, for sure, yeah. It's because, you know, the distance is so large that the flux, flux arriving from the star is very, very low. It's just, you know, how the numbers play out. Okay, distance? distance is uh, 13 astronomical units, 13 astronomical units, so it's 13 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Uh, so you can imagine, you know, how strongly you would uh, suppress uh, the starlight in this case. Question about this di direct imaging technique. Mm -hmm. So, as far as I understand, with this technique, you can see that the giant planets. Right. But right. As far as I know, because I'm not a planetary scientist, is to find uh, air funnels. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. This is why we do the rotation of mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Transits, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, direct imaging for Earth like planets is, uh, you know, uh, if it's difficult for a giant Jupiter, it's more difficult for a yeah. Right, right, right. So, uh, why do you see an interest here in this technique? In this technique? I mean, not in the subject. You know, why do you want to know about giant planets? If we know there is no life, if we know there is this giant bull of... Well, I mean, it depends on what you find interesting, right? I mean, some people uh, are trying to understand uh, the avenues of uh, planet formation, and the most obvious things that we see are actually the giant planets. They are the easiest to see. So, since you have them, you're trying to understand them. Of course, uh, and this is what we are using uh, this, uh, you know, direct imaging service uh, for right now. Of course, just make this happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. you know, planets were the first ones to be found. That's right. Yeah. Why? Because you know, when you use this computational method, this, it causes the, the biggest deep right. right? Yeah. Well, I mean, the first. Why do we need direct imaging to do the same? It's not the same. It's different. Uh, I mean, different uh, types of pl planets you are talking about. So, first planets were actually detected not by transits, but by Doppler technique. Uh, and these both methods, both transits and Doppler imaging, are sensitive to planets which are sitting close to their parent stars. They're moving in orbits. Um, 
basically most of these planets are in orbits which are within uh, the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Many of these uh, planets, even giant planets, are moving in orbits with a period of just one day. So they are, you know, they are being scorched by the radiation from their parent stars. The effective temperature on the surface of this uh, planet, the equilibrium temperature, would be something like 2,000 Kelvin. So this is a totally different kind of planet uh, compared to these guys, which are sitting much farther out. So uh, as I said, the, to understand the particular avenues of planet formation, you want to probe this separation ang range of several tens of astronomical units. And this is uh, the range of separations where no direct, uh, uh, no uh, Doppler, neither Doppler nor transits would ever be uh, competitive. But you're not into this search of life. Like not, not, with, not with these things, but actually, um, I mean, uh, what, you're, what you're saying, you know, trying uh, to, for example, see the, uh, basically an Earth analog, right? To, what would it take to see an Earth analog? So people, of course, have done the studies, and uh, there has been a proposal uh, about 10 years ago uh, to develop so-called TPF, Terrestrial Planet uh, Finder. Uh, I mean, because of the funding problems with, at NASA, at the European Space Agency, this idea has been sort of uh, shelved, but it's obvious that at some point, you know, in uh, 20 years and 30 years, uh, such thing will be built. So what, what, what do you need to detect an Earth analog? That is a planet with an Earth uh, size and mass sitting at 1 AU from its parent star. In this case, the contrast, uh, uh, because uh, this planet will be most likely pretty old, uh, and it's not going to be losing a lot of its own uh, heat, so you're only relying on the reflected light uh, that you uh, sort of uh, mentioned. And, that, and that, that ratio, then the ratio, the contrast ratio becomes something like 10 to the 9. Not 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6, but 10 to the 9. It's very difficult. It's impossible to do from the ground. So what you need is you need to launch a big telescope, you know, with the size of several meters, like, you know, 6 meters or 8 meters in orbit. And then you need to play the same tricks. You still need to do adaptive optics. Because uh, uh, even in space where you have very stable uh, environment compared to the ground, uh, you still will have, you know, like this thermal, uh, thermal uh, effects in the mirror and so on. So you still will need to do adaptive optics. You will need to correct the shape of your big mirror. You know, 6 meters is a huge uh, thing. You cannot just rely on it, uh, maintaining its shape down to you know, uh, small degrees of uh, nanometers. And you know, this is what you need. I mean, you really need uh, such huge mirrors and very good control of your optics to uh, get a suppression, you know, to suppress this starlight by a factor of 10 to the 9 and see the small uh, thing, you know, see the Earth, uh, Earth, uh, Earth emission and do the spectrum and maybe try to find, you know, uh, signatures of chlorophyll or, you know, clouds and so on and so forth. That's in the future. So all this technology uh, which we are developing now to see the giant planets will also be used to see uh, terrestrial analogs when uh, the time comes and you know hopefully it will not be you know 50 years from now hopefully it will be 10 or 15. I have a question about space debris. Mm -hmm. It's now very fashionable to put it to CubeSats. Yes, oh yes. Yes, yes. Do you see any technology coming that would avoid making them an increasing problem? Well, uh, I mean, one good thing about CubeSats is that they are small. And uh, the smaller is the object, uh, the stronger, uh, the, the more stronger it, uh, it gets affected by uh, non-gravitational effects, such as, for example, atmospheric drag, uh, or you know, effect of the solar wind, uh, radiation pressure, and so on. Uh, so that makes uh, that that causes all these non-gravitational non effects cause uh, the in spiral of uh, the orbits. And we all know, for example, that the International Space Station, you know, every year or half a year, you have to raise its orbit by several kilometers because it decays. Uh, due to this uh, aerodynamic drag. So for CubeSats, the effect will be even stronger because you know, the surface area grows as a size uh, squared, inertia grows as a mass as a size uh, cubed. So the smaller the you're, you're, doing, uh, you're making your thing, the stronger is the effect of aerodynamic drag. And if they are launched also in a pretty low Earth orbits, I think uh, they should basically have a relatively uh, good uh, sort of short decay uh, lifetime uh, that would not make them a big danger. But you really have to be careful because you know if you're launching them into a higher orbit then they basically will last uh, there forever until they will uh, you know smash into something so I, I, I sort of feel your pain and uh, <laughs> I sort of realize that uh, uh, CubeSats can be uh, sort of a big uh, thing uh, for the production of this uh, space debris so all this uh, big uh, uh, sort of burst in their development recently yeah should be watched uh, with care uh, with regard to this uh, space uh, debris production I noticed in both of your presentations there's this tight couple between progress and science. 
progress in technology. And sometimes you said well, this flourishing of science led to a new wave of technological innovation. Right. And other times you said new technology made certain new science possible. So you get this impression in both of the fields of work, there's this kind of positive cycle, the coupling of scientific innovation and technological innovation. So I've got two questions for you. Mm -hmm. is, how does it work? Is it really just a constant cycle of both of these things in all of these fields? And secondly, in your own work, are you involved in the technology development or using other people's technology? No, I'm, I'm, I'm mainly a user of the, uh, of the technology that's built you know, by people like instrumentalists uh, and so on. But you're right uh, that uh, a lot of the progress uh, in technology has been motivated by uh, progress in science. I mean, in astrophysics, we especially uh, see this quite well. In many, in, many, in many cases, we're just importing technology from somewhere else. Like, for example, the CCDs, with which we are observing uh, you know, stars and galaxies and so on. Uh, the biggest burst in their development was, of course, commercial, the development of CCDs for the, you know, for the cameras, for you know, these iPhones and so on. And now we have these uh, enormous CCDs with you know, millions and millions of uh, pixels that are used uh, in astronomical research. Uh, but once you have those, once you have these technological developments, then they allow you to do new science. And this is a clear example of it. I mean, uh, adaptive uh, optics, I have to admit, uh, uh, it also came from somewhere else. It uh, came from military applications, from not looking up, but actually looking uh, down uh, and avoiding uh, atmospheric, uh, trying to avoid atmospheric uh, turbulence. But then when scientists uh, realized its potential, uh, they borrowed this technology and developed it in their own ways that allows you to do these amazing things, which of course have no terrestrial uh, sort of uh, applications. But still, there is, uh, you know, this uh, amazing crosstalk between the advances of, in science and uh, in technology, and I think this will continue. I can just add one further question. As I was listening to you, I got this feeling that uh, technological change is more often than not the primary driver of scientific uh, possibility. Um, as a scientist, especially, I want to say that. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I would agree that, you know, in astrophysics we often uh, had big breakthroughs in, uh, you know, science when we had a uh, good technology, that's right. I mean, for example, Kepler satellite. Kepler satellite is uh, something uh, that allows us to do something that we would never be able to do with a previous generation of uh, facilities, like from the ground, for example. On the ground, you uh, can uh, monitor the brightness of the star at most at the level of, let's say, uh, 10 to the minus 3 or so, sort of 0.1%, simply because you have fluctuations in brightness caused by atmospheric turbulence and the stability of the telescope and so on. When you have something in space, you have much stabler platform that will allow you to do uh, the same uh, brightness uh, measurements to the level of 10 to the minus 5. So my, micro, sort of uh, 10 micro magnitudes. And that's, that's just really amazing and it allowed us, you know, these thousands and thousands of planetary candidates simply because we had a new piece of technology sitting up there. So I conclude that we should be this <laughs> um, I have two questions on the orbital reverse side. Number one, um, what, how, how do you, uh, what, what experiments are you suggesting perhaps to validate your model? Because my understanding is that with Kipsat, that's the lowest that we can actually detect right now. So going down to 10 centimeters. You can detect something like, you know, golf ball, basically. That's, that's currently, uh, currently detectable. And, you know, there are, of course, tens of thousands of objects in this size, size range that you uh, can sort of follow and that are trackable and that we know positions uh, are for. So uh, to validate models, uh, what I think we can do, I mean, first of all, we can model some of these uh, uh, previous uh, events that have occurred. For example, this, you know, satellite uh, collision or something like that. Uh, but then we have, uh, and this is, you know, my sort of astrophysical connection. I know, in num uh, we, we know a huge number of uh, uh, objects uh, that we can apply these models uh, to, that we can use as benchmark, uh, as benchmarks sort of uh, for testing uh, these models. You know, asteroid belt is a best studied and uh, the nearest uh, sort of example of such object. Then more distant in a solar system beyond the orbit of Neptune, there is a Kuiper belt, uh, <coughs> which has much more mass actually than the asteroid belt. And then on extrasolar scales, we have these uh, debris disks, which I uh, sort of uh, alluded to over here, the planetary destruction zones, I mean, these guys, where you also have uh, unseen population of asteroids. You know, n you know nothing about these asteroids except that the, for the fact that they 
they are colliding with each other and producing this dust which gives rise to this uh, emission. And these uh, systems, we have a large number of them, you know, hundreds and hundreds. So they would give us additional benchmarks for testing, uh, for testing these models. Of course, a lot of them will have uh, unknown inputs. We don't know what are the material properties of these colliding bodies here, for example. Um, you know, what are the physical properties of the colliding bodies. We have a much better handle on them in a solar system, in an asteroid belt, because we had, you know, spacecraft going uh, through the asteroid belt, doing measurements and so on. But I think uh, that, you know, we are these, these objects, like you know, various natural belts of minor bodies, are just gifts to us from nature to uh, give us tests for these models. Let's see. Oh no. Oh yeah. Here it is. The slope, well, as you can see, the slope is not uh, uniform. I mean, there are these uh, sort of waves uh, in a size distribution, and this is actually the waves that we are finding in our fragmentation uh, uh, models as well. Uh, th this, is a this is a theoretical, this is highly idealized model, so it's not exactly what uh, you should uh, uh, expect uh, seeing here. But the slope, um, slope, I believe, is not too far from uh, the, this is size, by the way. This is not in mass, in size. I, I believe the slope is close to the uh, d n uh, d uh, well d d d size uh, would go something like d to the minus three or minus four, and d to d to the minus four uh, would be uh, such a mass distribution in which you have equal mass and equal logarithmic uh, uh, beams of mass. D to the minus three already gives you most mass in the largest objects, and so we know that uh, in a Kuiper belt, uh, uh, sorry, in the asteroid belt, most of the most of the mass is indeed in you know Ceres, Vesta, in the biggest uh, in the biggest guys. So, but yeah, I mean, in, in, in the fragmentation models are something that we can sort of use to understand these distributions. <laughs> the question, so actually the invention of this imaging uh, was a lot, uh, gave a lot for astrochemistry community as well, mm -hmm. right? Because you know, now can uh, measure the gas, gas composition. Right. From your perspective, uh, what is the, uh, the core, uh, with, with what this chemical composition correlates? chemical content of this chemical composition of the star, the, uh, the gas nearby. I mean, you can have nickname or uh, water or mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, we can, I mean, of course, the obvious uh, thing to compare uh, the composition of a planet with is the composition of a parent star. Uh, and in many cases, uh, we can uh, get some interesting uh, hints. So, I mean, we, we get spectroscopy of uh, these uh, extrasolar planets not only for the directly imaged planets, but also for the planets which are transiting their parent stars. In this case, we are not seeing the uh, direct emission from the star, but what we are seeing is that during the eclipse, uh, you see starlight passing through the atmosphere of the planet. And so, at the limp of this, um, um, at the limp of the of the atmosphere, yes, you see absorption absorption lines, and you know the more let's say methane you have, the stronger absorption lines you would have. It's basically like you know seeing the transit of Venus in our own solar system and trying to infer uh, its uh, composition. Uh, but the correlations, yeah, I mean you definitely expect correlations with a. Uh, you know, whatever you would find in a star. Problem is that, you know, methane, for example, would not exist as a molecule in, in the stellar atmosphere. It would be completely broken up. But then you would have uh, uh, some idea about the carbon, presence of the carbon. If you see the enhancement of the carbon in a star, then you might hope that your planet will have a higher, um, sort of higher methane, uh, uh, higher abundance of methane in its uh, atmosphere. Of course, planetary atmospheres is a very complicated subject and uh, uh, the composition of the planet does not necessarily uh, reflect uh, the composition of, of the star. It's, you know, there is a complicated uh, interplay of chemical processes that affects uh, uh, chemical composition when uh, you assemble a big ball of gas. We have a good, uh, interestingly, we have good tracers of um, 
uh, bulk composition of uh, extrasolar objects in a very uh, unusual sort of uh, setting. And that's something, again, another part of my research that I didn't cover uh, in this uh, presentation. We observe uh, so-called white dwarfs, which are basically stellar corpses. Uh, it's a body with a mass of about uh, half uh, solar mass uh, and the size of an Earth. So it has an enormous density. It's you know 10 to the 6 times higher than the density of uh, water. Uh, and this is uh, the fate that awaits uh, the Sun. Sun will at some point, uh, you know, when it exhausts all its hydrogen in the core, will turn into a white dwarf it, by losing a lot of uh, uh, gas. What we see is in many of these white dwarfs, you observe in a spectra uh, presence of metals, which should not be there. And we think that what happens is that you, uh, this stars uh, still uh, retain their asteroid belts, and then the big planets scatter asteroids towards uh, the white dwarf. Uh, white dwarf tightly destroys these asteroids, and all these metals end up in the atmosphere. In this case, you can actually do very good measurements of abundances of different elements, and uh, there are large number, like several dozens of white dwarfs for which this has been done. And we typically find that the relative abundance patterns, you know, how much carbon there is, how much silicon, iron, oxygen, and so on, uh, are very, very similar to what we find in the inner part of our own solar system. So uh, strangely, you know, these stellar corpses, uh, you know, white dwarfs, allow, are, allowing, are allowing us to do sort of an autopsy on, uh, you know, the <laughs> sort of minor objects in these uh, extrasolar uh, systems. And this gives you bulk abundance, uh, not just, you know, whatever you have in the upper uh, atmosphere of the planet, as we have in the case of uh, these gas giants. Yeah, but I mean molecular formation. Well, molecular formation, yes, that, 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 that you can only do with, uh, with, uh, with gas giants. And in, in, that re in that regard, gas giants are, of course, extremely important. More questions? So let us thank Roman again. Thank you for having